I'm John Dowling. I've been uh, coming to the MBL since 1967 uh, and uh, for many years uh, did research here. Uh, then for a number of years uh, served as president of the corporation. In most recent years I come to the Woods Hole and continue to teach in the vision course and then in the zebrafish course. But uh, just co enjoy coming to Woods Hole and, and, and enjoying what Woods Hole and the MBL have to offer. I stayed at Harvard after I got my PhD, was first an instructor in the department and then an assistant professor, and uh, stayed at Harvard for three years as an assistant professor. And at that point, um, Johns Hopkins, the Wilmer Institute, the ophthalmology department, invited me down and inquired whether I might be interested in assuming a position uh, there in their new building that they had just built. Well, it was the custom at Harvard not to promote junior faculty, and so I accepted the position at Johns Hopkins and then spent the next seven years at Hopkins. And it was about halfway through that period of time. I went to Hopkins in 64, and I left Hop Hopkins in 71, and it was 67 that I was called by um, Spike Carlson. He was then chairman of biophysics at, uh, at Hopkins, and I'd gotten to know him because I had a joint appointment in his department as well as my main appointment, which was in the ophthalmology department. And he said uh, at that, that he was chairman of the education committee here at the MBL, and they felt they wanted to start, start a neurobiology course and asked if I would have any interest in uh, uh, teaching such a course. So I uh, didn't know very much about the MBL, so I came to the MBL first in the summer of 1967. Met a number of people and thought it would be fun to start a neurobiology course. So uh, the next summer, I think it was, I met Mike Bennett. We talked about joining forces and uh, teaching such a course. We planned it the summer of 69 and we started it in the summer of 1970. So that's what brought me to Woods Hole, mainly teaching, but of course I got very deeply involved in research too, right from the beginning. The first summer I was recording intracellularly from horseshoe crab eyes. It turned out to be an interesting story and then uh, uh, the next couple summers I worked on horseshoe crabs and then began to do some work on skates. I started by recording intracellularly from uh, horseshoe crab eyes and when you record from the eccentric cell of the horseshoe crab eye, what I discovered, and I made this discovery because I was using small young horseshoe crabs and this isn't seen usually in the older horseshoe crabs, is that when you give a very dim flash of light so that the horseshoe crab is essentially counting photons that that would cause a small depolarization in the cell, essentially a receptor potential. But then you would see very often a much larger, sharper regenerative potential that uh, no one had seen before. And uh, on the top of that regenerative potential was a spike. And so we've come to appreciate that neurons do this. That is, they use a regenerative potential as sort of a little amplifying device to, to increase the depolarization from a small depolarization near resting threshold to allow the cell to fire a spike. Uh, we didn't appreciate that at the time and everybody was puzzled as to what was going on, but that's our present day interpretation. So I worked on horseshoe crabs for two years and then I entered into a collaboration with uh, Harris Rips, who still comes to the MBL uh, works with Dick Chappell, a former student of mine. But uh, Harris had great expertise in uh, measurement of visual pigments with reflection densitometry, microspectrophotometry, and things of that sort. And I had been studying at Harvard light and dark adaptation in the rat. And uh, uh, 
we thought it would be useful if we could make parallel measurements of changes in sensitivity during light and dark adaptation with changes in visual pigment concentrations. I had done some of this earlier, but there were still a number of questions that needed to be answered. Uh, and we thought that if we could find a marine organism that was all rod, then we could explore light and dark adaptation over a much wider range of intensities than you can with any mammal that has both, or any animal that has both rods and cones. And the old literature said elasmobranchs often were only rods. So we first looked at, uh, at uh, dogfish, but found that they had some cones. But then what we found, and this might be the most important thing that I found here at the MBL, but let's go on from there, uh, is that um, the common skate, both the winter and the summer skate that you can find here locally, they are pure rod. And they were the first rod-only retinas that anyone had carefully documented. And we now know that there are a number of other species that are only rod, uh, but um, uh, that then it was the first time. The next project that we worked on, and this, this was pretty important too, I guess, or reasonably important, at least from my perspective, um, is that we were trying to get at the biophysics more of how photoreceptor transmitters drive or modulate second order cells. And the second order cells that we and others were studying was the horizontal cell in the retina because it's large and you can easily record from it and so on and so forth. This was the day before patch clamp, so what we were doing is sharp electrodes. And it was fairly easy to get into skate horizontal cells or horizontal cells of other fish. And uh, the way we thought it should be done, in fact other people were doing this, was to, to begin to culture horizontal cells. Uh, and the favorite animal to use for such cultures was uh, the carp or the goldfish. And you could certainly isolate the cells, but they didn't stay in culture very well. They would round up, and whereas we knew that there were several types of horizontal cells, indeed typically there are four types of horizontal cells in the retina, what was the case was that uh, after a day or so, the cells would round up and you couldn't tell subtypes of cells. So one summer, I think it was, yeah, it was the summer of 81, and I'll tell you why I know that. Uh, I decided to see if we could find uh, an animal whose retina we could dissociate, get cells in culture, and not have them round up. Uh, it's an interesting story how we came upon what we eventually ended up using, and it's the white perch, which is a close relative. It's not a perch, it's really a bass, a very close relative of the striped bass. And we're gonna come back to that in a few minutes as well. But anyway, um, that summer we had bought a new house on Oyster Pond, one of the coastal ponds right here in Woods Hole. And the first weekend we were there, a friend of my wife's came down with her 12-year-old son who had just had a birthday and he had a new fishing rod. So we went out onto the dock behind the house and uh, with his little lure started casting out and found we could catch these fish six to eight inches long. I didn't even know what they were, but they were great fun to catch. So Monday, which was my first day in the lab, I decided to see if we could dissociate that retina and see how well those cells survived in culture. And what was amazing is after the first isolation and 40 minutes to allow the cells to settle to the bottom of the dish, the cells looked beautiful. You could tell all four types. And the next day they were equally beautiful. And thereafter, so we start, we, I spent the rest of the summer trying to find out if there was another fish that was as good as white perch and we never did. So they became really a mainstay of our laboratory and we used these isolated cells for, oh, for a decade, studying their various properties. Well, the retina is a true piece of the brain pushed out into the eye during development. So it has all the characteristics of neural tissue. Very accessible, you can look into the eye pretty easily,
you can stimulate the retina nicely with light, and it's very easy to manipulate light in terms of intensity, in terms of wavelength, you name it. Um, and uh, so the, the, uh, in the retina, in many ways, is simpler than other parts of the central nervous system. You know what it's doing. <laughs> In other words, it's starting the processing of, of uh, visual information. And so um, you know, I've used it really as sort of a model piece of the brain working out over the years the circuitry of the retina. Um, with electron microscopy, we first identified uh, back in the 60s the synapses made by the various types of cells. And it turns out that there are two basic types of synapses made in the, in the retina, so-called ribbon synapses, um, which are made by the photoreceptors in the bipolar cells, and then conventional synapses made mainly by amacrine cells, but uh, some horizontal cells make the conventional synapses too. So you have then the input neurons to the two plexiform layers making one type of synapse, the interneurons in those plexiform layers or synaptic layers making a different type of uh, synapse. So it was possible even early on and then to begin to work out the, the wiring of the retina. So that's one great advantage of the retina. You can work out the circuitry. Secondly, by looking at different animals, you can record from each of the types, each of the classes of retinal cells. And we first did that down in Baltimore. It was done mainly by a graduate student by the name of Frank Werblin, who was an electrical engineer by training. And uh, with sharp electrodes, we could record from photoreceptors, horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and ganglion cells. And in fact, when we did that, we, we did it on the mud puppy retina. Why the mud puppy retina? That's an amphibian uh, that uh, has very large cells. And so we were able to record from each of the retinal cell types. And it was the first retina in which that was accomplished. So then we could take the anatomy that we had and the, and the physiology begin to put things back together again. Right now, what we're particularly interested in, or I've become interested in, is color vision. Because zebrafish, like other fish, are tetrachromatic. In addition to red, green, and blue sensitive cones, they also have ultraviolet sensitive cones. And, uh, and, and you find certain receptive field organizations at the level of bipolar cells in zebrafish and other fish that you don't find in the primate until you get into the cortex, double opponent cells. And we've been analyzing them and most recently working with a postdoc who now is a professor, assistant professor at one of the nearby colleges in Boston, we've been trying to understand what the role of the UV receptors are. And one of the reasons that we started looking at that is that we discovered in looking at the development of the zebrafish retina that the UV receptors are the first to mature. And what's going on there? Are they playing some special role early on in young zebrafish? larvae, five to ten days old. And it turns out that they are playing probably a special role in that, whereas as long been known, fish are positive, as larvae, are positively phototactic to visible light. What we've shown, and no one had done this before, is that they are very negatively phototactic to UV light. So that if you take a tank, Okay, and you divide it in half and you illuminate one side with visible light only and then the other, light, uh, other side with visible light plus some UV light, they stay away from the side in which there's any UV light. Why would they want to do that? Well, we all know UV light is harmful. And so what we did is we took fish and we raised them in a tank in which they were exposed only to visible light and then another tank in which they were exposed to visible light, some UV light. In the tank in which they were exposed only to visible light, about 90% of them from day three to 10 survive, which is about what you expect. You always lose some uh, fish in those early developmental stages. 
However, in the, in the tanks in which there was both visible and UV light, we lost, lost about 70% of the fish. So clearly it looks like it's a protective mechanism to keep the fish out of UV light. And of course, zebrafish in the wild grow and develop in really very shallow waters, only about a foot or so deep. So it would make a lot of sense that they have a mechanism to stay out of the UV light.